This episode is brought to you by Polestar, a car brand designing a future that's 100% electric. Polestar is saying no for all the right reasons. No empty promises, because Polestar turns visions into reality. No greenwashing, because their words are set in stone. No conquering Mars, because Earth is their priority. No compromises, because the planet deserves real action. Get the full story and explore the Polestar 2 at polestar.com. Special interest, dark money influence completely surrounding the court and a court that is either inured to it so much that it doesn't know it's there like a fish swimming in filthy water or is pretending that everything is okay because they want desperately to look like there's nothing to see here, folks. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the rule of law and teetering above all of those things, the U.S. Supreme Court. I am Dahlia Lithwick, and we decided to get the band back together and put a little extra Amicus in your feed with this special off-week episode. It's a special leaked episode, if you will, in order to consider the blockbuster story in last week's New York Times as reported out by Jody Cantor and Joe Becker. Cantor and Becker were following up on a report by a former anti-abortion activist, the Reverend Rob Schenk, who founded a group called Faith and Action, an evangelical ministry aimed at high-ranking government officials with its headquarters across the street, conveniently enough, from the private east entrance to the Supreme Court. As the story points out, Shank raised more than $30 million between 2000 and 2018 to give rich donors a pipeline to justices who needed to maybe have their spine stiffened a little in a series of religious liberty and abortion cases. The Times focused on the fact that Shank allegedly knew the outcome of the 2014 Hobby Lobby case weeks before it was announced at the court. Ostensibly, this was yet another leak at the high court similar to the Dobbs leak we learned about last spring. The Times also published a letter that Shank said he wrote to Chief Justice John Roberts in July, alerting him to the alleged breach years ago. Shank wrote that he thought the information might be relevant as part of an ongoing probe into the leak of the Dobbs decision. He says he received no response. But I think the justices' loose lips is the least worrying part of a larger story about wealthy evangelicals, pay-to-play access, and a court that yet again appears to be just completely bought and sold by way of a brisk trade in access and influence. Joining us to discuss this aspect of the story is Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. He is the United States Senator for Rhode Island and Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Federal Courts Oversight, Agency Action, and Federal Rights. Senator Whitehouse's brand new book is called The Scheme, How the Right Wing Used Dark Money to Capture the Supreme Court. It was published just last month by the New Press, and it traces this decades-long right-wing scheme to capture the courts, culminating in the seating of three Trump justices and ushering an era of a conservative supermajority intent on handing big wins to big business and the religious right. Senator Whitehouse, you and I have been talking about this almost as long as there has been an amicus podcast. First, congratulations on the amazing new book and welcome back. Uh, Second, (laughs) am I correct in asserting here that the focus on Alito as the Dobbs leaker is confusing and kind of distracting for a story that really is about how a handful of millionaires systematically funneled money through partisan interest groups and through, I guess, the Supreme Court Historical Society so that they could just buy access to justices that they wined and dined and vacationed with and I I gather also prayed with. Is that not kind of the big story here? The bigger story is the larger story for sure. And I think the larger story has an even larger component to it, which is that this aspect of lobbying influence using the Supreme Court Historical Society and private dinners and perhaps even vacations that go undisclosed with right-wing 
wealthy individuals with interests before the court aligns with and runs in parallel with the federal society influence over the justices and their willingness to go and basically do annual pep rallies with the Federalist Society. And that runs parallel with the dark money effort that actually used the Federalist Society as a venue to pick these justices to usher them onto the court. And then right down the hall from the Federalist Society, literally same building, same hallway, uh, the Judicial Crisis Network, which ran the political campaigns and the TV ad barrages to attack Merrick Garland and support Judges Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and Barrett. And you put all of that together, and what you have is an absolute mess of special interest, dark money influence completely surrounding the court, and a court that is either inured to it so much that it doesn't know it's there, like a fish swimming in filthy water, or is pretending that everything is okay because they want desperately to look like there's nothing to see here, folks. And I guess here's where I congratulate you on being uh, uh, sent up uh, by the chief judge of the 11th Circuit at uh, the Federalist Society gathering a couple weeks ago in D.C. I, too, uh, was name-checked as a crazy person. And I guess— Kind of makes our case, doesn't it? Well, it's amazing to me, just (laughs) parenthetically, that when you write these fawning puff pieces about Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society and the outsized influence, those are actually lauded and celebrated. But when critics say the same things, we're hysterical conspiracy theorists with string boards. Hard to sort of square that one. But I do want to ask... Well, setting aside, what the hell is a sitting judge doing going to a highly partisan judicial advocacy organization and stepping deliberately into a political debate? I mean, there was a time when judges wouldn't do that. And it just shows how much the uh, Overton window for bad behavior by Federal Society judges has slid Yeah, and we should note that Justice Alito got a standing ovation for his Dobbs decision at the same event. Yeah, they're pep rallies. Yeah, also a comedian, Justice Barrett, um, making jokes about being harassed at home. But I I do want to ask you, given that some elements of this new New York Times piece had already been reported in Rolling Stone and Politico, I know you had written a letter to the court about this. And I know how diligently you've been trying to write about this whole meta plan. Was there any aspect of the new reporting last weekend that shocked you? Uh, no, actually, because we've been at this so long that I'm getting pretty hard to shock. What took place was that we'd seen the activity with deliberately planned dinners with selected Federalist Society justices to connect them to very wealthy right wing individuals who would wine them and dine them in very fancy locations, and in the course of that whining and dining, impart to them their wish that they should be strong on right-wing cultural issues. That's pretty bad. If there's a feedback loop so that in return for all of that hospitality, they're also getting previews of coming attractions and decisions so that they can get the CEO of the petitioner company a good seat in the court to enjoy and revel in their success, that makes it even a little bit smellier. But the thing that really got me in all of this is that the Supreme Court, when we asked him about that and asked him specifics about that, what we got back was a letter saying, thank you so much for your interest. We have a code of ethics. (laughs) Okay, great. You have a code of ethics, but how do you enforce it? What are the, how do you make inquiries? Where do you file a complaint? What's the fact-finding process? When does a determination get reached and by whom as to what actually took place? And who do you report it to to let the public know that something happened? All of that architecture is non-existent with the Supreme Court, leaving the code of ethics just an empty wall decoration. And their persistence in refusing to do the basic work of establishing whether or not an ethics violation took place is what is intensely frustrating. We could agree or disagree about a finding that they reached, but when they have no process whatsoever and try to defend having no process whatsoever, 
And it's a court. My God, it's the Supreme Court. And they're the defenders of having no process. It makes no sense, and it's intensely frustrating. We are pausing now to hear from some of our sponsors. I'm Willa Paskin, the host of Decoder Ring, Slate's podcast about cracking cultural mysteries. We have a new season coming up full of juicy topics like, remember the viral phenomenon and optical mind blower known as the dress? Hey guys, what color is this dress? One of them said blue and black and one of them said white and gold. And within 10 minutes, there were like dozens of people screaming at each other. (laughs) And we'll look at another piece of clothing. This one from the past. The most obvious thing about the bustle is that it makes your butt look big. Why did these ladies want to have such big butts in the end of the 19th century? And what can we learn from the rise and fall of one of the most well-known personal injury law firms in America? Savino and Barnes, injury attorneys, 800-888-8888. Your connection to them is a jingle and the fact that they've just paid to be inside your head for so many years. Why am I having an emotional reaction to their breakup? You can hear these episodes and more on the new season of Decoder Ring, wherever you listen. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Now let's return to my conversation with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. One more piece of this that I think maybe we've both elided, but let's say explicitly, is one of the things that's reported, at least in the New York Times piece, is that it's not just the whining and the dining and the influence and the benign-sounding Supreme Court Historical Society. It's also that there are parties who file amicus briefs who have interests in the cases. So this isn't just the appearance of impropriety. This is actually having a dog in the fight, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And some of the... um Like Justice Scalia was a particularly energetic guest at hunting trips. We tracked, with the help of a lawyer who's looked at this stuff for a long time, many dozens of hunting trips that Justice Scalia took, which were undisclosed. But the reporting of them, particularly in like small local papers or law school reports that got wind of it, revealed that it wasn't just Justice Scalia going to a location. There was a whole little group, a little retinue of people who might have had connections with the fossil fuel industry, for sure had connections with the gun industry, and in some cases had filed briefs with the court on gun issues while they were at events with Justice Scalia. So there's a lot of mischief, if I would call it, around the non-disclosure of personal hospitality And the definition of personal hospitality has become just obscenely broad. And can we just dispense with the both-siderism? I mean, is there an equivalent, you know, I'm thinking of attempts to knock, for instance, Justice Ginsburg off the marriage equality cases because she had performed same-sex marriages. I know that Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson had to recuse from the Harvard Affirmative Action case this year. Is there something similar going on on the left side of the court that you and I just don't know about? Or are the justices on the the left far less inclined to have sort of prayer meetings and secret conclaves with wealthy donors whose money is laundered through the historical society. I'm not aware of anything similar with respect to uh, Justice Sotomayor, uh, Justice Kagan, or Justice Jackson. I think this systematized wealthy right-wing engagement with right-wing federal society justices is pretty unique, not just with respect to the two sides of the court, but also in time. This has not been a practice for the court in the past. 
in my view. I think we've come to a very peculiar moment in American history where we think it is okay for a private organization receiving unlimited secret contributions to be the vestibule, the turnstile, through which judicial nominees have to go to get on the Supreme Court, and then to have people who have been involved in that process argue in front of the justices without proper disclosure about their connection. I mean, the whole thing just is really unprecedentedly bad in my view. So I want to just put meat on the bones of the ethics problem, because these are, you know, questions you've been pressing for years, certainly, and you and I have talked about it before. By its own explicit terms, the code of conduct for the U.S. judges, other Article III judges, only governs the judges on the lower district courts and the federal appeals courts. It does not apply to Supreme Court justices. And the Supreme Court has been asked to and has, in fact, promised on occasion to promulgate its own ethics codes. It does not. Uh, I guess we heard from the Chief Justice John Roberts that they consult uh, the code of conduct, you know, the way one might consult like AccuWeather, I guess. But as you said, as a result, not only is there no enforcement mechanism, but each justice is left to determine for themselves if and when they want to comply. The cliche about the court is always that the Chief Justice has no power over the other justices because Functionally, as the cliche goes, each of the nine justices' chambers is, in fact, its own separate individual law firm. And so what you have is nine separate law firms that each adhere to or uh, consult with the code and then adhere to, as they see fit, whatever parts of the code they want to comply with. Yeah, which violates a judicial principle so old that it comes in Latin. Nemo judex in sua causa, never a judge in his own cause. And we have, the Supreme Court has set it up so that each Supreme Court justice is the judge in their own cause as to ethics violations. And there's no process. There's no procedure. There's no structure to it. And you saw this roll out when Judge Kavanaugh was on the D.C. Circuit and was the subject of active ethics investigations. And the day that he went from the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court, all of those ethics investigations stopped, not because they'd reached their conclusion, but because once he got to the sanctuary of the Supreme Court, there was no entity to pursue them any longer. Can we talk briefly before we talk about the Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act that you have introduced? Before we get there, I think we would be committing malpractice if we didn't also talk about Clarence Thomas and Ginny Thomas, because even though they are not the subject of, you know, this recent story in The New York Times, it's been an ongoing almost two-year story about the spouse of a justice, you know, texting Mark Meadows, calling state legislative officials and trying to have them change the outcome of election. How does, you know, let's stipulate for a minute that this is all up to Justice Thomas. He doesn't have to explain. He doesn't explain. But this is also of a piece because of the part of the ethics rules that say the standard is not impropriety. It's the appearance of impropriety, right? Well, the whole Ginny Thomas episode is precisely illustrative of the problems that we are talking about. And it's a double-decker problem. The first deck of the problem comes because the original response to the question of whether Justice Thomas should have recused was him saying, and by the way, sidebar, him just saying publicly, not to anybody to whom it would be a false statement, not with any intellectual or investigative rigor, just putting it out there, that he knew absolutely nothing, nothing, not a single thing, had no inkling of his wife's insurrection activities. So believe that or not, it is a factual proposition. And it is a factual proposition that lends itself to inquiry. And the chief justice had launched the marshal of the court to make factual inquiry about the Dobbs opinion leak. So he could perfectly well 
launch factual inquiry into what Justice Thomas knew and when he knew it. And he didn't. Nothing was done. His word was taken as if it was legit. And then we had this most recent vote in a similar question, again by Justice Thomas, but now we know that he knows what his wife was up to because everybody in America knows what his wife was up to because it has been in the news what his wife was up to. So whatever veneer there was that he had no clue about his wife's activities was completely shattered, and yet still no comment, still no recusal, still no inquiry from the Chief Justice, still just the pretense that this is all okay and that there's nothing to see here, folks. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. In March 2020, a family on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in Lame Deer, Montana, got shocking news about their loved one, Christy Woodenthigh. My daughter had came and notified me that Christy was run over. And I said, is she okay? And she's like, no, she died. I was like, what? Missing Justice from CBS News takes you inside what really happened that night and the federal investigation that followed. Listen to Missing Justice from CBS News on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Go beyond the headlines and deepen your understanding of the forces shaping our world today on The Political Scene, a newly updated podcast from The New Yorker. With episodes three times each week, The Political Scene accesses the sharpest minds on politics, offering insight and analysis about everything from abortion rights to the war in Ukraine. Join me, Tyler Foggett, for conversations with the most knowledgeable minds from The New Yorker that will dive deep on the most interesting political story of the week. Then, Susan Glasser, Jane Mayer, and Evan Osnos gather to hash out what's happening in Washington, D.C., with an insider's understanding of the high stakes at this perilous moment for American democracy. Plus, our editor David Remnick will provide you with insightful storytelling with a mix of interviews and profiles. That's all happening on the political scene. Make sure you're following it now, wherever you get your podcasts. And we are back with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Senator, I think one of the hiccups here is that the chief justice either has some kind of enforcement power as against his colleagues or he doesn't. And one of the stories we always hear is, look, the chief justice is just a ninth vote. He has, you know, an administrative role at the Supreme Court. There are certain duties that come along with that. But he really doesn't have authority over his colleagues. And then we hear, as you just said, well, he certainly had authority to launch an investigation into the Dobbs leak and to decide who the investigators were and to determine that this was going to happen in secret. He has clearly some power. Can you help me understand? Because I have told both of these stories at different times. Is he just one of nine justices who can do nothing if Clarence Thomas doesn't want to abide by the ethical rules? Or does he have some meaningful power over his colleagues? He has multiple roles. One is just one of nine justices, and he's in that role when he's writing his opinions. Every justice has the right to write their own opinions the way they want to, and nobody can tell them what to do. As the chief justice, he also has the power to assign opinions when he's in the majority, so that's a little extra thing for him. But he also chairs the Judicial Conference, which looks at rules related to the courts and that can create examples for the Supreme Court to work with. I think that he could summon the chief judges of the 11 circuit courts to be a panel to which the court could refer ethics questions for independent advice and then produce a public report back to the court that could answer these questions in a public way and put some discipline into the private self-serving decision-making of the justices. I think that would be well within his power. And he's shown that he can tell the marshal to go investigate stuff. So there's more to it than just, I'm just here one of nine. There are avenues through which he can bring his power as chief justice to bear on this question. And that sets aside the fact that as chief justice, If he were to talk about this in a different way, if he were to be proactive about understanding that there's a problem, that could make a very big difference in the conduct of his colleagues as well. 
Senator, I want to get to the portion of the show where you get to say, I told you so, where you get to say, <laughs> Dahlia, you and I have been having this conversation as long as we've known each other. We both, we <laughs> both get to say that, unfortunately. Well, but you know, you, you actually, I think, have something to say to the many, many, many people out there who just tend to have such a deep sense of learned helplessness around this issue that they just throw up their hands and say, there's nothing to be done. Uh, so I want to give you really an opportunity, both both to talk about uh, the legislation that you've introduced uh, with Representative Hank Johnson of Georgia that would at minimum create some robust ethics rules. But then I think after you've sort of explained that, I really want you to take a moment and tell folks who have some kind of weird magical thinking in which there is nothing whatsoever that anyone can do, we have to live this way, why they're wrong. Yeah, um, I guess I'd start by saying that the public is beginning to come to understand that this is not a conservative court. This is a captured court. And indeed, even a very well-respected middle-of-the-road reviewer of the court, Linda Greenhouse, used that exact word in a recent piece in the Atlantic magazine. And they're captured in the same way that in the bad old days, a railroad commission would get captured by the railroad barons. So it would set the rates for the railroad that the railroad barons wanted. That's the model that we have to look at in terms of what they achieved. The method of achieving it, we have to look at as akin to an intelligence community covert operation. A lot of the trade craft of covert operations was used as they stealthily crept up to and captured the Supreme Court and now instruct it in what it is that they wish to get done. And so I think once people have those two thoughts in mind, that this is a captured court, not a conservative court, and that the manner in which it is captured is akin to an intelligence type covert operation, then you can begin to think about what the solution is. Once you've identified the illness, you can begin to think about the cure. So I think it's really important for all of us to focus on the problem first and not get too far ahead of our skis and start offering solutions to problems that the public has not yet gotten accustomed to. And we've got work to do, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book. I didn't blow all those weekends and nights for nothing. I, the people are our judge and they need to understand what it is, what our case is, so that they can then decide whether to permit extraordinary relief in the way of major changes at the Supreme Court. But the easy stuff ought to be, look, recusals, you got to explain, and there's got to be some fact-finding around them. Dark money in and around the court has got to be disclosed. These fake amici coming in as masks for other special interests who don't disclose themselves, that crap has just got to end. And this business of receiving gifts of hospitality and then pretending that it's personal hospitality, even if you receive it from somebody you've never met, it's not legit. And you've got to, that's basic stuff we ought to clean up. Then you can move on to term limits, which I think are appropriate. I have a bill to that effect. And then ultimately, I think we need to reconsider whether for this day and age, and particularly after this unpleasant history, uh, nine is still the correct number for Supreme Court justices. So I think maybe my very last question is this. Is there any utility in having, I know Senator Durbin, chairman of uh, the Judiciary Committee, said in a statement that, you know, this is very serious and it highlights the absence of federal ethics rules. Is there some utility in having a just full on January 6th style hearing in which all of these complaints and allegations that have piled up over the years get aired and surfaced and we begin to have at minimum a conversation about what you described is the problem so that if nothing else, there is some sense that this is kind of being aired publicly and in a big, coherent way, as opposed to these kind of tiny drip drip revelations that almost don't get covered? Absolutely. Positively, yes. And one of the reasons we need to do that is because if you are a little consortium of big special interests that have spent more than half a billion dollars 
to get control over the Supreme Court, the last thing you want is to have the legitimacy of your captured court questioned. It doesn't work. Your captured court is only effective for you to the extent that it has credibility. So there's going to be an enormous effort to say, move along, folks, nothing to see here. This is all perfectly normal. You see these justices just immensely invested in claiming their own legitimacy without looking at the real problems that are in front of them that even other federal judges see, and they just pretend not to see it. Again, that faux legitimacy that they are trying to preserve is something that has to be taken on because it's not real legitimacy. It's faux legitimacy. And we need to make the case in an organized way as to what happened, why it happened, who did it, and what it means. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is United States Senator for Rhode Island. His brand new book is called The Scheme, How the Right Wing Used Dark Money to Capture the Supreme Court, published just last month by the New Press. It really is, I think, a must read. And I think that for those of us who've been sort of sounding the alarm for years and years that this thing was happening, to the extent that you are only now learning that it has happened— I think this is the book you need to read. Senator Whitehouse, thank you so much, as ever, for your diligent attention to this and for your time today. And you, Dahlia, for being such a champion yourself. Thank you. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus, the Off Week edition. Thank you so much for listening in, and thank you so very much for your letters and your questions. You can keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. You can always find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Today's show was produced by Sarah Birmingham. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio. And Ben Richmond is senior director of operations for podcasts at Slate. We will be back with another regular episode of Amicus on December 3rd. Until then, take good care.